I think you're me at first. You're leaving my favorite nightclub. But then you say goodbye to friends I don't know in an accent that isn't mine. You head into the night. There's a clicking sound as you go. I guess you're wearing high heels. You turn down an alleyway beside the cinema. I've lived in this town all my life, and I didn't know that path was there. There are footsteps behind you. Your pursuer is probably wearing flat shoes because they make more of a clap than a click. You increase your speed, but it's difficult in your impractical footwear. You glance behind. There's a figure. It looks like a male in black clothing. I can't make out anything more in the dark. You look down at your feet. Your stilettos have too many straps to undo quickly, so you reject the idea of removing them and pick up the pace as best you can. Maybe he isn't even a threat. I'm unsure if I'm hearing your thoughts or if I'm guessing what you're thinking. Your pursuer's footsteps get louder and faster. You run. You scream when his gloved hands wrap around your neck until the breath is squeezed out of your throat. You double over in pain when he punches you. It knocks the wind out of me, of you. I feel something warm running down your leg. You look and see blood, your blood. It wasn't a punch. You were stabbed. There's a distant trilling sound. It pulls me away from you. You need to stay, your voice pleads. Are you talking to me? Look at his face, you beg, as the scene folds away. I'm awake, sweating in bed, my heart pounding double time. The trilling is my alarm. I turn it off and work on steadying my breathing. It was only a nightmare, but you felt so real. I'm searching Google to see if any stab victims were found in the alleyway beside the cinema, and it occurs to me that maybe the alley doesn't exist and was concocted by my subconscious, but then the results load, and I find you. Your name was Neve. You were found three months ago, dead before help could arrive. I briefly wonder why I didn't hear about this but I don't consume the news very often, and the headlines are usually dominated by the pandemic and corrupt politicians. Your killer was never found. The police are still appealing for witnesses. I remember your words. Look at his face. Were you reaching out to me from the grave? Why me? We didn't know each other, did we? I dismissed the thought as ridiculous. It was just a stupid nightmare. My phone rings. It's B. Hi, Kelsey, she says without enthusiasm. This seems ominous. She never calls me by my unshortened name. It's usually Kels. What's up? I ask. Brad didn't want me to tell you this, but I think you deserve to know, she answers. Brad is her boyfriend and my tattoo artist. He did my latest piece last week, a cross surrounded by flowers. It's healing well. I can't imagine what the problem could be, but she sounds worried. What is it? I demand, desperate and reluctant to hear the answer. There was a mix-up with your tattoo ink. What do you mean? Ink is ink, isn't it? B sighs. Not exactly. Dan got ready to ink some dude getting a memorial tattoo for his girlfriend. The ink contained her ashes. Only the guy got delayed and had to cancel his appointment. Dan didn't tell Brad what it was and went off somewhere. So Brad thought it would be alright to use it on you, giving it was already set up and everything. My breath feels trapped in my throat. I can't believe this. I remember Dan coming back halfway through my sitting. He looked concerned, but I didn't think much of it at the time, and he didn't say anything. I guess he didn't want to face the music in front of me with the ink already in my skin. 
The thought of some stranger's ashes on my body for the rest of my life doesn't sit well. But what can I do? Maybe legal action is an option, but B is my best friend. Suing Brad's parlor could damage our friendship because he's her boyfriend. Plus, she works on reception. She could lose her job. She doesn't deserve that because of someone else's careless mistake. I'm so sorry, Kels. Brad is devastated. The guy is furious because he's already scattered the rest of the ashes. He's causing a storm on social media. We've been getting canceled bookings and even death threats. I'm glad we didn't tell him someone else had the ink. We said it got lost. It's okay. It was an honest mistake. It could have happened to anyone, I say, trying to keep my voice calm. In fact, I'm furious, and I don't think it could have happened to anyone but Dan. But, as I said, what can I do? The rest of my day is average. I go to work, come home, eat, clean the kitchen, go to bed, the whole time trying not to think about how a dead stranger's remains are on my skin forever. I dream of you again. I'd forgotten about you after B's revelation. It's almost a repeat of the nightmare from last night, but this time I fight consciousness when you look up at your attacker. It's not easy to make him out in the darkness, but there are lights on in the building that runs alongside the alley. I catch his features as he moves his head. I see blue eyes and prominent cheekbones. His teeth are straight and glowing white, as if he's had work done in a strive for perfection. I notice this when he smiles at you maliciously. It makes my skin crawl and my heart break. He runs back down the alley after stabbing you. The trilling of my alarm drowns out his fleeing footsteps. I'm awake again. I ring B. What was the name of the deceased whose ashes are in my tattoo? I ask when she picks up. I don't know. I need you to find out. Why? Please, B. I need to know. She sighs. The thing is, we can't exactly ask the guy. He's still trolling us on the socials. We'll probably have to deactivate our accounts. I hang up and find the Facebook page for Brad's parlor. I need to find confirmation of what I already know. The trolls might have mentioned you. It's your ashes, isn't it, Neve? I scroll looking for your name. B's right. The posts are brutal. Hundreds of them. I'm guessing my ink was meant for this man with a golden retriever as his profile picture, because he comments most often. I click on his profile. It hits me like a brick to the face when I scroll down and see him, the monster that killed you. I check if he's tagged, and he is. Neil Cunningham. He's not Golden Retriever guy, but they must be friends. I click through to Neil's profile. It's mostly private, but there are photos of you. There's one of you together. You're holding up your left hand, and your ring finger boasts a diamond. She said yes, reads the caption. There's another of you in a wedding dress. Amongst the 83 comments, someone jokes about how Neil's minted now. Were you wealthy, Neve? I've found him, like you asked. What the hell do I do now? You don't tell me. I don't dream of you again, but in the morning, my tattoo pulses with pain. I message Neil, claiming to be a reporter. Don't worry. I altered my visible Facebook details to support this lie. I tell him I want to write a piece to warn others about Brad's parlor. He takes the bait and agrees to meet me in the alleyway for a photo shoot. I persuaded him this location would pull on people's heartstrings and make the situation more damning for Brad and Dan. He is already there when I arrive five minutes early. I'm Kelsey. Neil, he replies. Then he asks, How much are you paying me for this article? I answer his question with a question. Didn't you get enough money from Neve? What? 
He snaps, his eyes darkening as he senses danger, but it's too late. The knife is already in his chest. I tear it down his body before tugging it free. I'm wearing gloves, but the knife can't be left behind. People are more likely to survive if foreign bodies stay in place for medical professionals to remove. He tries to call for help, but his mouth is too full of blood to make any sound other than barely audible grunts. He pulls out his phone, but I snatch it from his grasp. He looks up at me, and I imitate the cruel grin he flashed you as best I can. Then I show him my tattoo. You shouldn't have missed that appointment, I tell him. I delete my Facebook account. A tech expert friend helps me bypass the password on Neil's phone, and I delete our conversation. But I figure this might be a great time to go traveling. I fall asleep on the plane and don't dream of you. I hope this means you're at peace now. I wonder whether you approve of what I did. I didn't think the police would take my dreams seriously, and by going forward, I'd have drawn unwanted attention to myself if taking matters into my own hands was the only option down the road. He must have been a prime suspect, considering the money he gained from your death. If there was any evidence, surely the police would have found it. I'm trying not to think of myself as a murderer, because I'll never kill again. And neither will he. I shouldn't have come back alone. It's my first visit since my wife passed away. We used to rent this place every other summer. It's where we got together although it didn't happen till our second summer here. I knew memories of her would haunt this place, but I thought I'd feel connected to her, not consumed by her absence. I'm contemplating going home when the doorbell startles me. I'm not expecting anyone, and this place is off the grid. There are other cabins about a mile in both directions, so maybe someone is lost looking for one of those. My breath catches when I open the door to find her looking up at me. My Libby, not a day older than she was that first summer, she's returned to me. My euphoria is quickly replaced by the empty yet violent sense of loss I felt since her death. It's not her. The nose is slightly too broad, the lips too full, but the eyes are hers. I wonder if Libby had a baby before we met. But no, she would have told me. Is Elizabeth here? The girl mumbles. There's something strange about her voice. She looks frightened. Such terror doesn't belong in those eyes. Who, who are you? I ask. I need Elizabeth. I'm sorry, but she passed away from cancer last year. How did you know her? Silent tears stream down her face. I've never met her. But my dad said I should come here if there was an attack, and I escaped and he didn't. Now I've got no one. I realize what's wrong with her voice. I can't place the accent. It doesn't match any country I'm aware of. It's unlike anything I've ever heard. I ask, how old are you? Sixteen. What's your name? Atlas. Atlas. It's a common name where I'm from. I nod, trying to think where Atlas would be a common name. Well, Atlas, I'm John. Was Elizabeth your sister or another relative? She was my mom, Atlas replies. This confirms my initial thought, but it's not possible. We couldn't have children because of me. We were weighing up IVF versus adoption when she got the diagnosis, and life as we knew it was over. Libby desperately wanted a baby. We both did. But we were happy. I know my wife. She wouldn't have lived as contently as we did if she had a daughter she couldn't contact. I also know beyond a doubt she would have told me. Who is your father? I already know what she's going to say. But it makes the idea that Libby had a baby even more impossible. Was. 
My father was Lucius. I should probably tell you about that first summer. We were 16, the age Atlas is now. It was our first time renting this place, but we instantly felt at home with the cabin itself and the surrounding lake and forest. My brother Dave was with us, and two of Libby's friends, Cassie and Mabel. We enjoyed the two lazy, idyllic days before he turned up. He came to the door after dark, claiming to be lost, but I instantly distrusted him. He was in the complete wrong area for where he said he was trying to go. Only an idiot would get so far off track. He also had no bike, car, or method of transportation. People hike around here or camp with gear, but not walk from one place to another in a three-piece suit carrying nothing. The weirdest part was how the girls acted around him. Libby and I had started to get close, and I thought she liked me, but as soon as he turned up, I was forgotten entirely. Cassie and Mabel were a couple. I thought they were devoted to each other, but Cassie suddenly had eyes solely for Lucius. She's bisexual. I'm heterosexual, but I can recognize an attractive man. I wasn't drawing over him like Libby and Cassie, but I was aware he was exceptional. Libby offered him a bed for the night, despite my protests. Mabel was also dead against it and she went home when Cassie continued to flaunt herself in front of Lucius. Our guest left the next morning. Libby was in a low mood after that. Cassie seemed embarrassed by her behavior the night before, and left to repair things with Mabel. I felt slightly confused after Lucius's departure. I wonder why I thought he was so exemplary. I didn't understand how his presence had been so commanding. He seemed terribly average to me now. After a few days, we were once more enjoying our stay. Libby cheered up and we began getting close again. Dave said he felt like a third wheel without Cassie and Mabel there. One night, I got up for a glass of water and found the front door wide open. It was warm enough to have the door open, and with the cable being so remote, it was unlikely we'd be burgled, but we always locked the door at night just in case. I got an immediate sense of foreboding. I cautiously went outside hoping someone couldn't sleep and was sitting out on the porch, but nobody was on the decking or anywhere in sight. I decided to check on the others. Libby wasn't in her bed. I ran to Dave's room and woke him. We went looking for Libby in and around the cabin, but we couldn't find her. She didn't respond to our yells. There was limited signal, but that didn't matter because Libby had left her phone behind. We called the police using the landline in the cabin. The authorities weren't too concerned at first, but when she wasn't back the following night, they arranged a search party for the morning. Locals volunteered to help, and Cassie and Mabel came back. We combed the woods for miles. Divers searched the lake, but there was no trace of her. One police officer seemed to suspect me and Dave, so I was getting extremely worried about that on top of Libby's well-being. She returned just after midnight that night. She didn't understand why we were so relieved to see her. When we asked where on earth she'd been, she had no recollection of the past two days. She claimed she went outside for a breath of fresh air 15 minutes ago. It took us ages to convince her we weren't joking, and she really had been gone two days. I think it was only when the police came around in the morning to question her that she fully believed us. A paramedic examined her and concluded there was no sign anything was physically or mentally wrong, but that she should go to the hospital for thorough tests. Libby agreed to an appointment the next day, and the doctors there deemed her healthy. She went missing again two weeks later. We didn't contact the police. I wanted to, but we were worried they'd blame us. Dave convinced me that she'd come back safely again if we waited. Mabel and Cassie seemed to reluctantly agree. Dave was right. She returned a few agonizing days later, again with no memory of the lapsed time. But this time was different. Previously, she was her usual upbeat self after she returned. This time, she was deeply depressed. She didn't want to talk about it, but she told me she felt like something was missing, like something important had been taken from her. She gradually started feeling better over the next few weeks, 
I had suggested going home in case she went missing again, but with Cassie and Mabel back, the others wanted to enjoy the holiday. The rest of our stay was uneventful. This was where the story ended. Libby never remembered what happened during the lost time, and she never blacked out like that again. I had no reason to think of Lucius. When he occasionally crossed my mind, it was just a strange but seemingly harmless encounter from long ago. Was your father involved in Libby's disappearance that summer? I asked Atlas. Yes, my dad was an incubus. The time my mom couldn't remember would have been when she was on our ship, the first time being impregnated with me, the second when the embryo was removed. How could an embryo so young survive? We have incubators far superior to the ones on Earth. Also, I'm not human. I'm not a succubus either. That's the female equivalent of the incubus. Only 40% of fetuses get the gene, so I'm more like a human than a demon. But it's how our children are born, or were. My planet is gone now. Your planet, I say, trying to compute what she's saying. I feel like I should be dismissing her claims as crazy, but something rings true. Between her obvious resemblance to Libby, the puzzling encounters with Lucius, and Libby's blackouts, I believe her. What happened to your planet? There was a war. We only had moments to get away. My dad was too far from the escape pod. I saw other pods, but I'm not sure how many came to Earth for refuge. Some probably went to the old Predoria. I nod, as if I know what or where that is. It's bizarre Lucius assumed Libby would be here all these years later, but he was very odd, and possibly unaware of how things work on Earth. A more unsettling thought is that he kept tabs on us. Atlas starts sobbing violently. What am I going to do? She cries. I take her hand. Your mother was the love of my life, I tell her. A daughter of hers is a daughter to me. Dear Dad, You probably remember a theme park gate, as Mom called it. I'll recap just in case and so you can hear it again from my point of view. I'm also going to post this letter online for reasons that I'll explain later, so the listeners need to know what happened. Ellie took her boyfriend and his best mate to the theme park. Logan and I tagged along. He was my oldest and, quite frankly, only friend. The cues for the rides were ridiculous. We waited three hours for one roller coaster. I wasn't hungry and didn't need to use the bathroom, so I stood in line for the next ride while the others went to find the restrooms and get food. Ellie and her friends joined me half an hour later, and they looked at me blankly when I asked about Logan. They swore they'd never heard of him. I told them it wasn't funny. I expected Logan to jump out of somewhere laughing. This wasn't his sense of humor, or Ellie's for that matter. But I thought the older boys must have put them up to it. Only, they looked at me like I was crazy the more I demanded to know Logan's whereabouts. Ellie's boyfriend accused me of pranking them, and his friend called me a spectacular actress. This was before the days of most people having a mobile phone, so I couldn't call Logan. I was hysterical. By the time the others insisted that we needed to go home, leaving Logan behind, although in their minds we weren't abandoning him because he didn't exist. Ellie called you and Mum from a phone box when I refused to go without him. I was sure you would wonder what was wrong with her, but you didn't remember him either. He had been to our house countless times. You were friends with his parents and I mentioned them by name. And you told me they only had one child, a daughter, Logan's sister. I dug out the photo albums the moment we got home. 
Logan was missing from pictures he used to be in, including the framed one in my bedroom, which now showed an empty corridor. It made no sense. For months, I begged everybody to remember him, but as far as they were concerned, he never existed. His mom said it was strange because she was going to call her son Logan if she ever had a boy. She was adamant that she'd never told anyone this, but she still didn't believe me, just like everyone else. There are accounts of similar events online, but usually the writer moves away and returns years later to find their friend no longer exists. I couldn't find another account where the victim was there one instant and gone the next. The loss of Logan and the confusion around this traumatized me. But eventually, I moved on with my life. People insisted he was an imaginary friend, to the point that I almost believed they were right. It wasn't until I met Luke that I got answers. You never liked him, did you? But as doomed as our relationship turned out to be, he was and still is the love of my life. The pieces connected on Valentine's Day when I saw his name in my card. It was Luke, with a C and not a K-E. I asked if it was short for anything. He said Lucifer. I joked, like the devil? And he told me he descended from Satan. After a moment's laughter, I realized he was serious. I wouldn't have believed him if not for what happened with Logan. I kept an open mind after his disappearance. I asked how he could be certain he was related to the devil. He said, because he has supernatural powers. I barely believed him, suspecting it was a joke after all, until he told me the specifics. One man in every generation of his family is born with the ability to wipe humans from existence. They were raised from the world, absent from the minds of everyone that knew them, removed from photos, anything they ever wrote or sent, all gone. I asked if he took Logan. He said no, but it must have been someone with demon blood. According to Luke, some part demons erase humans for sport, while others remove people for their own safety or for the protection of others. The gift can only be used to take one person every 20 years to prevent people vanishing left, right, and center. I posed the question I had wondered since that day at the theme park. Why could I remember Logan? Luke said it's not unusual for there to be an exception, somebody who was connected to the departed more intensely than anyone else. Logan was my soulmate. He was never going to be lost to me. I asked if Logan went to heaven. Luke said he didn't know where the erased souls end up. Some part demons believe they're moved to or still exist in another plane or universe. He couldn't even tell me what capacity heaven exists, but I didn't mind because I was comforted by the idea that in another life, me and Logan are still together, or at least is growing old somewhere, even if I don't feature in his new world. As you know, my romance with Luke was short-lived. I really loved him, but he was a complicated man with an uncontrollable temper. I was happier and safer with Rich, or that's what I told myself. Rich and I would have gone the distance if I hadn't been infertile. I truly believe that. But the strain of our failure to conceive, followed by years of unsuccessful IVF, left our marriage on the precipice. Charlotte brought us back from the edge. I thought it wouldn't be possible to love anyone more than I loved you and Mum, more than I loved Logan, more than Luke, until I finally became a mother. I've often wondered if my infertility 
was a sign that I wasn't meant to have children. Hugh convinced me Charlie wasn't born to die, and that's why I'm writing this letter. I begged Luke to erase me from the world when the cancer took my little girl. I pleaded even harder that I'd beg for someone to believe me about Logan all those years ago. He refused. You found me at my lowest the day you came round after Rich left. I asked if you wish I never had Charlie. You were adamant that you would take the pain of losing her for the time you had together. You said every day with her was precious and you'd never give that back. This stayed with me. It helped me carry on. Last night, I dreamt Logan and Charlie were together, but they were running from something. They weren't safe. I was woken by my phone. It was Luke calling, and he said if I still wanted him too, he would erase me. By the time you're reading this, I'm already with Luke. It's too late to stop me. Please, don't try. I'm hoping by sending this email from a friend's account, you'll still get it, even if I'm gone when you check your emails. I also had a voice artist record this letter and post it online. Luke will send you the link in case the email vanishes. If it's somebody else's voice uploaded to the internet when I still existed, surely it will remain. I hope so. I'm not doing this because I want to die. I'm leaving this version of Earth because Charlie could be alive somewhere else. What if she's in trouble? What if I could be with her in another world? I don't know if she's out there, but I know for certain I won't find her in this life. I hope you can understand and forgive me. Most of all, I hope you don't forget me. Luke says my family will still think of Charlie. You'll just be confused about her origins. Hold her close. She lives in your hearts and minds if nowhere else. You taught me that our memories are sacred, even if they're painful, so I know you wouldn't want or choose to lose all recollection of me. Mom will think she has one daughter. Ellie will tell people she's an only child. But you, Dad, be my exception. Picture my face. Remember me. It was a dark and dismal Halloween, the full moon almost entirely concealed by heavy clouds. There was an autumn chill in the air, but it was a dry evening. No rain was forecast, so all over town, people were getting ready for a night of spooky festivities. Hermione and Tia were doing each other's makeup. Across town, Emmy shrieked as a house spider crawled across the kitchen floor. Paul crushed it under his nikes, and Emmy felt guilty. She wouldn't have drawn attention to the creature if she knew her brother would do that. Two streets over, Tiffany and her friends were enjoying pre-drinks before going out to celebrate her birthday. The corn maze lay empty and waiting. A slight breeze stirred the stalks. They moved in waves, like a vast ocean. As some of the townsfolk entered the final hours of their lives, All Hallows' Eve was just beginning. I open up, bitch, Tiffany said, holding out a white pill. Courtney didn't know what it was, but she would have guessed E. She wasn't the biggest fan of drugs, but she wanted to fit in with her new friends. Her family had recently moved to the area. She had spent the first three weeks at her new school painfully alone until Tiffany invited her to join the popular crowd. She couldn't believe her luck. Come on, it's my birthday, Tiffany coaxed. So Courtney opened her mouth, stuck out her tongue, and let Tiffany give her a pill that had been cut with goodness knows what. It tasted vile as it started to dissolve, so she took a swig of vodka and cola to swallow it down. Paul, Daniel, and Emmy, all dressed as zombies, were the first of our cohort to head out into the night. They wanted to go trick-or-treating before the maze. 
Paul thought it sucked that his mum had insisted he take Emmy, but she'd been alright so far and hadn't embarrassed him in front of Dan. Yo, check this out, Paul said to his friend before leaping onto a jack-o'-lantern outside a neighbor's house. The carved pumpkin collapsed into pieces under his weight. Dan burst out laughing. Emmy didn't look impressed. Paul and Dan proceeded to make their way down the street, flattening every pumpkin in sight, until a man came out of his house to yell at them, and they sprinted away. Emmy struggled to keep up and was relieved and out of breath when the boys stopped a few streets over. That was awesome, Dan gasped. Let's do it again, Paul suggested. I don't want to, Emmy objected. I've got a better idea, Paul replied. He picked up a rock in a nearby garden. Ants scurried in all directions until he ground them beneath his feet. An hour later, Hermione and Tia were walking to the corn maze. They were dressed as Maddie and Cassie from Euphoria. Halfway there, Tia suddenly gripped Hermione's arm. Don't make it obvious, but look at the guy behind. I think he's following us, she whispered. Hermione discreetly looked around to see a tall, lone man, dressed as Jason Voorhees. He might also be looking for the maze, Hermione pointed out. I know, but he was on the other side of the road going the other direction. He crossed over and came back this way when he saw us, Tia replied. Let's go the wrong way and see if he follows, Hermione suggested. Tia nodded, and they took a left when they should have gone straight ahead. They made a few more turns into a quiet residential cul-de-sac. The odds of this being Jason's destination by coincidence were low. The girls waited and were horrified when Jason rounded the corner. Tia's grip on Hermione's arm became painfully tight as their bodies went rigid with fear. What do we do? Hermione whispered. She felt relatively calm because they were surrounded by six houses. If she screamed, surely someone would hear and come out to help. But four of the houses were in darkness. I think we should run. There's an alley on the other side of that house, so we don't have to get past him, Tia said. On three. One, two, three. Hermione was worried about the safety of fleeing to an alleyway whilst being pursued by a creep. But Tia had already taken off, so Hermione ran after her. At least they had won trainers, choosing comfort over style. Tia almost barreled into a group of trick-or-treaters in the narrow alley, but the children flattened themselves against the wall just in time. Hermione glanced behind to see Jason struggling to get past the kids. This bought them enough time to lose the creep. They got back en route for the corn maze. Hermione was slightly concerned Jason would guess that's where they were going, but hundreds of people would be there. She figured this would prevent him from being able to do anything at the maze itself, so they'd be safe if they got an Uber back afterwards, to make sure he couldn't wait at the exit and follow them home. Tiffany and her friends stumbled out of the house. Courtney was dressed as a mummy. Dennis was Frankenstein's monster, although he kept saying he was Frankenstein no matter how many times Courtney corrected him. Tiff was a sexy cat, and most of the others were witches or vampires. Courtney didn't know half of their names, but the shyness she usually felt around them was gone. She found herself wrapping her arms around one person after the next as they made their way to the maze. Her usual worries no longer plagued her. She wasn't missing her friends from back home. She didn't care that the classic literature novel taught at her new school was different from the one she'd been studying at her old school and this would probably affect her exam results. In this moment, she felt elated, like this town was exactly where she was meant to be. Tia and Hermione joined the cube for the corn maze. They kept looking around, but there was no sign of Jason. By the time they reached the front of the queue, they had stopped worrying. They were surrounded by people. Even in the corn, they knew they wouldn't get far before running into staff or other maze goers. After paying a member of staff in a zebra onesie their $2 admission fee, they stepped tentatively into the maze. The aim was to get out the other side, no doubt with scare actors jumping out at them along the way. Your tits aren't big enough to be Cassie. Some jerk yelled at Hermione as he and his mate started past. Fuck you, Tia called after him. Hermione was relieved when it was little kids that dashed past them next chanting a nursery rhyme. 
Pumpkin Jack, Pumpkin Jack, see his face and you'll go splat. I remember that song, Tia said with a smile. I've never heard it, Hermione replied. You didn't grow up around here, that's probably why. It's a local version of the Pumpkin Jack urban legend. If you squash too many bugs throughout the year, Pumpkin Jack squishes you on Halloween. Is he a giant? Mm, I guess so. I've never really thought about it. Tiffany's group went around the side of the maze when they arrived. Because it was her birthday, they had bought premium tickets for a private section of the maze where they'd play a survive-on-your-own horror movie game. They'd have the maze to themselves at least until their time was up when they'd be ushered out so the next group could go in. Courtney downed the rest of her canned cocktail, but it didn't quench her thirst. She was raring to go, so she struggled to concentrate on what the staff member in the clown costume was saying. If you turn your tickets over, you'll see there's a letter A or B in the bottom of the right corner, the clown explained. If you have the letter B, you're the murderer. Don't show anyone else your letter. The point is to not know who you can trust. Murderers, you can collect your weapons from the treasure chests you'll find in the maze. Victims, you aren't allowed to take anything from the chests. If a murderer touches you with a weapon, you must lie down until the siren sounds to indicate the game is over. If you make it out the other side of the maze, you've survived the night. The game starts now. The group surged into the maze. Courtney realized she hadn't turned over her ticket yet. She flipped it to learn she had the letter A. There were a lot of turnings in the maze, so before long she couldn't see her friends. At one point she glimpsed a vampire disappearing around a corner ahead of her, but otherwise encountered no one. After staggering into countless dead ends, she tried to walk through the corn, but the stalks were too dense to get beyond three or four steps. Paul, Dan and Emmy each paid their $2 admission and entered the maze. A man in a hockey mask overtook them. Amy thought it was strange that someone would come to the maze alone. He wasn't an actor because he didn't try to frighten them. Courtney ran through the maze, not knowing or particularly caring if she was going in the right direction, or unwittingly, moving back towards the entrance. She stepped into the corn when she saw Dennis, but couldn't fully remember why she was hiding. When Dennis was out of sight, she stumbled back onto the path. She felt hot, nauseous, and extremely thirsty. Everything went black. She could feel it happening, but was powerless to stop it. She collapsed to the cold ground, her body jolting in a violent seizure. Paul glimpsed a scarecrow with a rotting pumpkin head walking backwards into the corn. He thought that actor was shit. Dan and Emmy didn't notice him. Weren't these people meant to scare them? Tiffany found Courtney lying motionless on the ground. The new girl was good at playing dead. Her chest was barely moving. Who's the murderer? Tiff whispered. But Courtney didn't reply. Obviously, not willing to cheat. Fuck you then, Tiff said playfully, and crept on through the maze. She didn't realize Courtney was in the final moments of her life. By the time Dennis passed Courtney five minutes later, that one little pill had claimed her life. Dennis had let her be in the bottom right-hand corner of his ticket. Damn it, he thought when he saw Courtney. This meant he wasn't the only murderer. Hermione and Tia squealed as an actor with a fake chainsaw leapt out at them. They ran onwards. Hermione expected the chainsaw wielder to give chase, but... He stepped back into the corn, ready to scare the next customers. Shit, Tia muttered, pulling Hermione into the corn. Hermione started to speak, but Tia shushed her. Jason stepped onto the dirt path they had just vacated. Hermione held her breath as he passed, no more than an arm's length in front of them. The siren sounded. The game was over. Tiffany had made it out without being caught. She walked back around the side of the maze to the entrance. Here she met most of her friends. She and Becca were each given a bag of lollies as a reward for evading the murderers, Dennis and Leroy. Someone asked, where's Courtney? 
Tia and Hermione decided to head back to the entrance. Tia thought she remembered the way, but they were soon lost. Then they heard screaming. Hermione froze in terror as she realized these weren't the screams of maze goers shrieking at scare actors. They were unbridled cries of death. A man further down the path lifted his girlfriend onto his shoulders so she could see over the corn. A lorry has just crashed into the maze, the girlfriend gasped. There was a deafening blast. The couple was swallowed by a wall of fire and the explosion threw Tia and Hermione into the air. Paul, Dan and Emmy heard the blast. They noticed the smoke curling above the distant cornrows. The screams of the dying brought tears to Emmy's eyes. We've got to get out of here, Dan said urgently. He saw the burning chunk of debris seconds before it would have hit him. He grabbed Emmy and pulled her out of its path. Paul wasn't quick enough, but debris squatted him like a fly. The explosion tore its way through the maze. Half of the stalks were immediately engulfed in flames, and the fire was spreading rapidly through the other half. Thick smoke disorientated survivors as they tried to escape. Tia screamed Hermione's name, but dirt and soot clogged her throat. Between this and the screaming around her, she knew there was little chance of her friend hearing. They'd been separated when the explosion tossed them like they were no heavier than tennis balls. The heat was unbearable. Her eyes stung as they watered, and her bare arms felt like they were burning, despite being blemished with nothing worse than cuts and bruises. She tried to stand up, but a sharp pain in her ankle overwhelmed her and she fell back down. She knew the smoke would soon consume her whole, and she tried to come to terms with her imminent death. Then, two men lifted her from the ground, and between them they carried her to safety. Hermione stumbled through what was left of the maze, flames surrounding her. She couldn't see Tia anywhere. She called out for her friend and wasted valuable minutes trying to find her. To have any chance of surviving, she'd need to make her own way out, and hope Tia would do the same. The fire sounded like crackling rain. It provided a backing track for the endless screaming. Outlines of the other people occasionally became visible through the smoke, but they were so fleeting she felt alone. She tripped over a fallen cornstalk. Somebody caught her before she hit the ground. She looked up into Jason's black eyes, visible beneath his mask. The search for Courtney that would have commenced was postponed after the explosion. Instead, the staff member dressed as a clown escorted Tiffany and her friends to a field a safe distance away. They watched in equal parts horror and fascination as the fire devoured the maze. They knew Courtney wouldn't survive. Hermione tried to punch and kick Jason as he hoisted her over his shoulder, but none of her strikes seemed to faze him. Her cries for help were lost in the cacophony of chaos, and the thickening smoke hid her plight from nearby survivors. Jason carried her to the back of the maze and out through the field beyond to his waiting van. Dan and Emmy spluttered as they struggled to find a way out. They thought they were going to die when they ran into a firefighter. He led them out of the maze to an ambulance where they were treated for smoke inhalation. They cried for Paul, who they knew without a doubt had perished in a fire. Everyone assumed the same about Courtney and Hermione. But you and I, listener, we know better. There was an air of excitement as we boarded the minibus. I wish I had known how special and short-lived our exhilaration would be. I'd have savored it more, the final ember of normality. I thought I recognized the driver when I passed him on the way to my seat. He was an older man wearing a flat cap. He wasn't one of the regular bus drivers, but I was certain I'd seen him somewhere before. I was too captivated by the electric atmosphere to pay it much mind. Soaring up, soaring up, 
Colton chanted our school's slogan as the bus pulled away, his voice echoed by the classmates we were leaving behind. I listened until they could no longer be heard. I felt a pang of sadness for my best friend Vicky, but she knew she was never going to make the cut. Only teams of six were permitted to enter the breakdance championships. There were ten dancers in our school collective. We all knew Mr. Bryant would be choosing six of seven. Vicky, Patrice, and Hillary weren't as advanced as the rest of us. I really thought I would be the one to narrowly miss out, but Colton messed up a lift and dropped Elle. She was worried she would be axed because of it, but she did everything right. It was Colt that entered the lift in the wrong stance. To say we were shocked when he didn't make the team is an understatement. He was our captain and best dancer. Nobody was more surprised than Colt himself. He didn't take the news well. Mona's untimely death was a blessing to him, although he'd never have admitted it. Hey, sir, how long will it take to get there again? Jez called out. About three hours, maybe less if we're lucky with traffic, Mr. Bryant replied. Mandy struggled to open a packet of corn puffs, and they exploded everywhere. But Mr. Bryant didn't notice, and the rest of us had a good laugh. Elle stopped smiling abruptly. Her eyes were transfixed on the front of the bus, as if she'd seen a horrific monster lurking there. "'Are you okay?' I asked. She didn't appear to hear me, so I repeated myself in a louder voice. "'Huh? Uh, yeah. Just nervous about the dance,' she replied. Her tone was light, but she still had a petrified look in her eyes." I followed her gaze, but I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Phoenix suggested a game of I Spy, and Elle's episode was soon forgotten. The bus left the city behind, and we found ourselves cruising through the countryside, with woodland on either side. I swear this road wasn't so long when I went to the stadium with my dad, Phoenix said. I realized he was right. I had also been to the stadium a few times as a spectator, and I recalled the woodland road stretching for about 30 minutes, yet we'd been here an hour. But it was a straight road, the driver couldn't have got lost or taken a wrong turn, so I assumed we were misremembering. The road was completely clear, I hadn't seen another vehicle since we left the city, so it wasn't traffic holding us up. Sir. Is this the right way? Jez shouted out. Yes, Mr. Bryant answered, but he didn't sound convinced. He was peering out the window with a puzzled look on his face. I've seen that sign before. We're going round in circles, Ellen insisted. That's not possible. It's a straight road, I responded. What sign? Colt asked. The wooden one that said Maitland Farm, and then an arrow. Have we ever passed Maitland Farm? I asked. I haven't seen it, Phoenix replied. Mandy and Jez shook their heads. We better not miss our slot because of this. They won't let us go on late, Colt said angrily. We all glanced at each other in concern. There was a lot at stake. The winning team would pretty much have their careers set for life. The prize was a huge tour supporting one of the best dance troupes in the country, plus contracts with top managers and choreographers. We couldn't afford to miss our shot. Mandy screamed. She was looking toward the front of the bus, her face full of horror. Jeez, you made me jump. Phoenix complained. We don't have time to get hysterical. It will be all right, Mr. Bryant told us before resuming a hushed conversation with the driver. Colt looked momentarily perturbed, but it was so quick I wondered if it had been my imagination. What did you see earlier? I whispered to Elle, realizing Mandy had been looking in the same direction when she screamed. But 
Elle just shook her head. The next time we passed the Maitland farm sign, I saw it. We are going in circles, Phoenix exclaimed. Mr. Bryant asked the driver to pull over. Sir, we're going in circles, Jez called out. We can't be. This road goes straight to the city, Mr. Bryant replied. There was uncertainty in his voice, but I knew what he said was correct. We couldn't be lost. The bus had continued north. Passing that sign again wasn't possible. There must be more than one sign for the farm. Why are we wasting time stopping? Mandy moaned. Despite her words, she sounded ill at ease. Shouldn't it be getting dark by now? Elle wondered aloud. She was right. At home, I'd be eating dinner at dusk around this time, yet the sun was still bright in the sky. Mr. Bryant hung his jacket over the sign, then he reboarded the bus and we drove on. I was not surprised, yet somehow completely shocked and terror-stricken when we passed the sign again. The jacket was there. It was the exact same sign. There was no doubt now that we were indeed going in circles. Mr. Bryant rummaged for the map after retrieving his jacket. I tried to get the sat-nav on my phone, but there was no service. Does anyone have signal? Colt asked. One by one, we realized we didn't. I glanced at the driver, and that's when I saw her. His brown eyes turned hazel, the surrounding skin youthful instead of wrinkled. His wisps of hair were replaced by her long auburn locks. Mona. My scream was locked in my throat. My heart pounded so hard I was sure it would give out. This couldn't be happening. But it was. Mr. Bryant instructed the driver, who now possessed his own face again, to drive on. We passed the sign again and again. Try turning round and going back the way we came, Phoenix suggested. No way! We'll miss our slot, Colton objected. But he must have known it was already too late. We were due to perform in 45 minutes. Mr. Bryant told the driver to turn around. I was looking forward to getting back to Vicky and my parents, who hadn't been able to get time off work to watch the performance. But like before, we saw the farm sign over and over. Elle and Mandy were crying. Mr. Bryant looked bewildered and defeated. I don't think the boys had fully accepted our predicament. Our 45 minutes went by. We kept driving until the bus ran out of fuel. Our food and water supplies depleted soon after. Mr. Bryant and Jez started walking to get help. I knew they wouldn't find any. If we couldn't escape the road on wheels, why would it be any different on foot? I watched them disappear behind the horizon. I can't begin to describe the level of thirst I experienced as timeless hours passed. My throat was like sandpaper. My chest felt like it was about to cave in on itself. We squabbled about insignificant grievances I can't recall, taking our frustrations out on each other, arguing about what to do when there was nothing to do, until we were too tired and thirsty to do anything but sleep or sit in silence. Jez and Mr. Bryant eventually found themselves back at the bus, having trekked full circle. Mr. Bryant was too thirsty and exhausted to keep going, but Jez insisted on trying to escape through the woods. He saluted me before disappearing into the trees. That was the last time I saw him alive. This is your fault, I told Colt in a weak, croaky voice. The bonfire had been his idea. We were celebrating the dance team, acing our audition and making the championships. All ten of us were there, the benched four happy for the other six, allegedly. Colt brought drinks and pills. It was unlike him. He normally feared alcohol would affect his dance ability and prospects. He never wanted to risk an accident or declining health.
Drugs were usually completely out of the question. I should have seen this as a red flag. He insisted we all partake in the narcotics. It was hard to say no to Colt. Vicky, Hillary, and Patrice passed out on the forest floor. Colt joked he'd given the losers a higher dose, seeing as they didn't need to protect their health as much. I felt angry for Vicky and wondered if I should get help, but Phoenix assured me she'd be okay and suffer nothing worse than a headache in the morning. Mona asked Colt why he hadn't taken one of the loser's pills. He got angry and called her names I won't repeat, but he seemed to get over it quickly. He suggested a walk in the woods. I didn't want to leave Vicky, but as I said, it was tough saying no to Colt. We were dancing and singing at the top of our lungs when we reached the cliff top. The wind was harsher out in the open, and I shivered. The sickly air reeked of leaves and salt. Colt was spinning Mona around, leading her closer to the edge. I was about to call out a warning, but something stopped me. Colt released Mona's hand, and she stumbled at the same moment that Jez tripped over his feet. They collided, and I watched in horror as Mona vanished over the cliff. Death interrupted her screams. I'll never forget her shattered body on the rocks below. Mandy laughed. Elle looked distraught, but pulled Jez into a hug, despite what he'd just done. You did that on purpose, I yelled, glaring at Jez and Colt. Don't be a dumb bitch, of course I didn't, Colt snapped. But I knew the truth. We can't win without Colt. Phoenix said. You knew? I asked in shock, but he didn't hear me. In a louder voice, I said, you're right, realizing they might throw me over if they thought I wasn't on board. I forced a drunken laugh. Vomit kept surging up in my throat, but I swallowed it down. I hate to admit this, and it's hard to be sure because it all happened so fast, but Phoenix was right. We stood the best chance with Colt on the team. I saw what was going to happen, and I didn't try to stop it. In the weeks that followed, as we rehearsed for the championships, only L seemed affected by the events of that night. One day after practice, she confided in me that she'd told Mr. Bryant what happened. I was relieved. I knew I would be in trouble for not saying anything, but Colt... Jez and Phoenix would get the punishment they deserved. Maybe Mandy as well. I wasn't sure if she had known about the boys' plan beforehand. I was happy the truth had come out, although it seemed odd that Mr. Bryant had continued with practice as usual after learning what happened. Then Elle filled me in. He told her not to tell anyone else, that if she or I said anything, he and the rest of the team would claim they were together when Mona wandered off with us. I begged Elle to go to the police with me, said they might believe two of us, but she refused. I thought I was going to win her round, but in the end, she was adamant that if I went to the police, she would support the team's lie. Elle said perhaps it was for the best, that going to the police wouldn't bring Mona back, and the rest of us didn't deserve to have our lives and careers ruined because of one mistake. That was exactly what we deserved, yet I convinced myself she was right. Coming clean wouldn't restore Mona's life, and we stood a real chance at winning the championship. Mona's death was ruled an accident, and we carried on with our lives. I tried to convince myself that Jez just tripped, and Colt broke his sobriety solely because he didn't make the team, that Mandy laughed in shock, not malice, and Phoenix's comment was an attempt to console himself, rather than an admission of premeditated murder, that I was too high to call out a warning, not that I wanted her to fall. Back on the bus, Elle was muttering something. I turned to her and glimpsed the driver out of the corner of my eye. I finally realized where I'd seen him before. 
He was sweeping leaves at the cemetery when I went to visit Mona. It's ending, El croaked. I glanced back at the driver, but it wasn't his eyes in the rear view mirror. I did hear you, Mona told me. Her lips didn't move. Her voice was in my head, as clear as my own thoughts. I knew instantly what she was talking about. Yesterday, when I sat crying at her grave, I begged for forgiveness. I said I wanted to go to the police, but the others would blame it all on me. I told her I was sorry, deeply sorry. I said I hoped she could hear me. The bus exploded in blinding light. I closed my eyes, covering my face with my arms. The stars above were spinning when I woke up. It reminded me of being on a roundabout as a kid. My fingers touched rough gravel. My skin felt hot, like I was in front of a radiator. The stench of smoke overpowered everything. My muscles ached as I sat up, battling to steady my vision. The bus was an inferno, its front end crushed against a tree. Sirens pierced the night. The charred bodies of Mr. Bryant and the other five dancers were removed from the bus after firefighters extinguished the flames. The paramedics said I must have been thrown through a window during the crash or explosion. I was covered in glass cuts and minor burns, but I wasn't seriously injured. There was no sign of the driver. I don't think the authorities believed me that there was a driver until my classmates said they saw him when the bus left school, although nobody could agree on what he looked like. The head teacher couldn't find the records identifying him. He's either missing, presumed dead, out there alive after escaping the fire, or Mr. Bryant dropping him off somewhere and taking over behind the wheel, or... He never existed, and everyone that saw him was lying or mistaken. It depends on who you ask. A few people suggested he was a ghost. They're closest to the truth. I look out for him every time I place flowers on Mona's grave, but he's never there. Lola came back into my life when she turned up uninvited to our annual Halloween party. The bash was in full swing when my mate Gavin approached me. Man, it was that weird chick in the witch costume. There were about 20 witches, so that didn't exactly narrow it down. Which one? I asked. Outside, she was digging in the dirt. I'm not joking. I followed him to the window. I had to wipe condensation caused by a house full of party guests from the glass. Plus, it was hard to see through the fake spider webs my wife had used to decorate. But I immediately recognized Lola, and my stomach dropped. She was standing on the lawn, hands covered in soil. She briefly caught my eye before turning her face to the side and walking out of view. I started to second-guess myself. It couldn't have been Lola. I hadn't seen her in 12 years. It was dark, and I had no idea what she looked like now. I tried to convince myself it was just some woman that resembled her, but I knew I was kidding myself. I'd never searched for her online, and I assumed that was mutual. It disturbed me to think she might have been monitoring me all these years. Who is she? Gavin asked. No idea. Must be one of Cleo's friends. I lied. Or maybe someone's random plus one, Gavin suggested. She'll end up digging up Tibbles as shit if she's not careful, I joked, trying to make light of the situation so Gavin wouldn't notice the tension I was feeling. Right on cue, the cat jumped onto the windowsill, demanding attention and getting fake spiderwebs caught in her tail. I put Lola to the back of my mind as the night went on, and I forgot about her after a few more drinks, whilst catching up with some friends I hadn't seen all year. It was until I found Cleo in the bathroom. Like me, 
She used the ensuite in our bedroom to avoid queuing for the toilet downstairs. She had scrubbed off her bluish vampire face paint. This struck me as odd because the party would continue into the early hours of the morning and she'd spent hours making her skin appear gaunt and cracked. Her eyes were slightly red. I didn't know if this was from removing her yellow Halloween contacts or if she'd been crying. What's wrong, baby? I asked. She turned into my arms and started sobbing. What's wrong? I repeated, more urgently. Someone threw something in my face. I don't know what it was. I was so scared. I moved her face in front of mine so I could check for injury. There didn't seem to be any redness or swelling on her skin. It must have been someone's idea of a practical joke but we held this party every year and nothing like this had happened before. Our friends knew better than to treat my wife that way. Who was it? Did you see him? It was a woman in a witch costume. Was she wearing a black dress, purple streaks in her hair? Cleo nodded. How did you know? Who is she? No idea, but Gavin saw her behaving strangely in the garden. I'm going to tell the bitch to leave. I stormed through the house and out the front door to where I last saw Lola, but she wasn't there. After checking the back and front gardens, I went inside and scoured every room. She was gone. I even checked the rooms party guests weren't permitted to enter. We didn't lock these because the doors didn't have keyholes and our friends respected our boundaries. I checked in closets and under beds, relieved, but also fuming when I didn't find her. I wanted the chance to tell her where to go. I double-checked that nothing seemed amiss in our daughter's room. Payson was at her grandparents' house, but the idea of a stranger in her private space still disturbed me. The party ended an hour or so earlier than usual. I think people could sense something had happened although we didn't tell anyone. I kept asking myself why Lola would show up after all this time. I'd had worse breakups. If a crazy ex was going to come out of the woodwork, she wouldn't have been my first guess, or my second. Did she want money? It wouldn't have surprised me. Distant cousins I'm not even sure I'm related to had got in contact after my promotion to executive editor at the film company where I worked. I told Cleo to go to bed and offered to finish cleaning up. We tended to leave most of the mess for the morning, but any spillages needed to be dealt with immediately. I looked up Lola on social media for the first time since we went our separate ways. Back when I knew her, she was an aspiring actress. I was going to introduce her to my contacts in directing and casting, but I forgot, and then we weren't dating anymore. It seemed she was now practicing holistic therapy. I've never understood why people chose that crap over standard medicine. Her posts were mostly about her work. The only point of concern was that she was following Cleo. This was proof she'd kept tabs on me. Cleo wasn't following her back, so I felt confident there'd been no attempt at conversation. I'd never told Cleo about Lola. It didn't seem necessary. It's not like Lola and I were ever in a serious relationship. Surely, nobody tells their spouse about their sexual encounters, especially when there's been a lot of them. I put Lola to the back of my mind in the days following Halloween. She rarely crossed my mind until it was my turn to drop Payson at school. It was a cold morning, the type that reminds you winter is on the doorstep. I hid my hands in the warmth of my pockets and felt something other than the silk lining. There was a sharp sting on my right index finger. I snatched my hand out to find a paper cut. I sucked on the metallic blood to prevent staining on my clothes or alarming Payson. After saying goodbye to her, I hurried back to the car and removed the square of paper from my pocket. I unfolded it to reveal a message constructed from individual letters cut out of magazines, the type of anonymous hate mail people received before social media. 
It read, your lovers never reach your age. Break the cycle or you will pay. I didn't know what it meant. Was it a threat? It didn't seem specific enough to take to the police. It kind of made it sound like I was going round murdering my exes, but they were all alive and well to my knowledge. My jacket had been on the banister during the Halloween party. Maybe someone thought it belonged to somebody else. Lola flashed through my mind. She was younger than me when we dated, but this never bothered her, and obviously she was above the age of consent. Maybe the note wasn't from Lola. Gavin mostly dates university students despite being in his 40s, and he has a similar jacket, so perhaps it was left by a girl he scorned. I decided not to tell him about it. He didn't need the hassle. And I figured anyone cowardly enough to leave an anonymous childish note didn't have the balls to do anything in real life. I ripped up the note and threw it out the window before starting the car. I found Cleo staring at her reflection in the hallway mirror when I got home. I said, I thought you had a meeting. She turned to face me. I couldn't help but take an involuntary step back. She didn't look well. Her skin was pale and dry. Deep lines surrounded her eyes and mouth that hadn't been there yesterday. Cleo usually could have passed for being five years younger than her 32 years, but now she looked 10 years older. I don't understand, she murmured, her eyes full of tears. She gently touched the delicate skin around her eyes, as if this would somehow iron out the wrinkles. I use SPF every day. I knew I wouldn't look 25 forever, but how can I change so quickly? Her voice rose in pitch as she became hysterical. I took her in my arms. It's okay, baby. Maybe go and see the dermatologist if you're worried. Could you be coming down with something? No, I feel fine, aside from the stress of this. It doesn't matter, I assured her. You know I'd still love you if you woke up looking like Fiona. Fiona from work? I laughed. No, from Shrek. Cleo giggled, and some of the worry left her eyes. This alone took years off her. I managed to persuade her to go to her meeting, but not before she'd applied a thick layer of makeup. I looked up sudden aging on my phone. Google said it could be caused by stress, but Cleo wasn't under any more strain than usual, to my knowledge, and even if she was... The amount of change overnight seemed unlikely. Bereavement was another common cause of rapid aging, but we hadn't lost anyone recently. I made her a doctor's appointment to be safe, but after blood tests and routine health checks, she was declared healthy. The situation escalated as the weeks wore on. By Christmas, her skin was incredibly thin and fragile. She looked three times her age. In January, she took sick leave from work on the pretense of severe depression. And soon, there wasn't much pretending involved as her appearance took its toll on her mental health. The new year also brought physical health problems. She complained of muscle and joint ache, and a few weeks later, she started walking with a stoop. She was diagnosed with early onset arthritis and osteoporosis. The medics were bewildered. They said they'd never seen such a severe case in somebody so young. My laid-back wife was gone. She became reclusive and rarely laughed. It was devastating to watch her deteriorate. I wanted desperately to help, but there was nothing I could do. She was in overwhelming physical pain, and mentally, where she used to be confident, she was now self-conscious. She said it's not body dysmorphia when you're actually ugly. Things ground to a halt in the bedroom. My sympathy for Cleo drained somewhat over time because I was left to take Pace into school and all her other commitments whilst taking on extra projects at work to cover our lost income after Cleo got laid off. I felt 
like a single parent. Both sets of grandparents stepped in, and by springtime, I was not only managing my extra workload, but finding time to socialize again with Gavin and the team. I met Julia at the Easter social. She was dressed as a sexy bunny, somehow leaving nothing to the imagination, yet rendering me desperate to see more. Gavin and the younger lads were all over her, but she only had eyes for me. I found her repeatedly meeting my gaze across the room as the others surrounded her as they tried unsuccessfully to make a move. I stayed behind as my colleagues called it a night one by one. Payson was staying the night with my parents, and I knew Cleo would already be in a depressive slumber, neither missing me nor aware of my absence. Julia asked me to buy her a drink, and I realized we were the last two stragglers. I offered to take her to a club as the bar would be closing soon. She agreed, but we never made it because one thing led to another in the street, and we ended up in the back seat of my car. I've been seeing Julia for two weeks when Miranda broke her silence. Her words, not mine. She made a TikTok video claiming I took advantage of her. Which is ridiculous, because she came on to me. She obviously wanted more followers, and knew nobody gave a damn about her unless she had my name in her mouth. We dated for a month or two, about a year before I met Lola. Miranda was 16 at the time, and I was 31. At least according to her video. I can't remember, and she offered no proof whatsoever, but this didn't stop the trolls from coming after me with their fake accounts. She wasn't claiming I did anything without her consent, so the point she was making was unclear and nonsensical. She said she felt manipulated because I was older. Luckily, there were no shortage of people, including Gavin on three different accounts, pointing out that 16 is the age of consent in the UK, and she was old enough to know what she was doing. I was shocked when HR department at work asked me about it. I almost resigned in outrage. Miranda was never involved with the company, and dating colleagues isn't prohibited anyway, provided any relationships with subordinates are declared to HR at the outset. Fortunately, I didn't quit on impulse. We needed the money with Cleo off work, and because no crime had been committed, I was just given a formal warning. That makes my blood boil. A warning for what? They never really answered that question. I started looking for another job in protest, hoping to be headhunted by a rival production company. I had turned down offers in the past, which I now regretted. Julia, who is 23 by the way, didn't buy Miranda's bullshit, and our affair continued. Sometimes I returned to Miranda's video. I don't know why. It served no purpose, aside from torturing myself. Two months after the video was posted, a comment from Lola appeared, claiming I did the same thing to her. Jeez. I suddenly remembered the note left in my jacket after the Halloween party, and realized Lola must have sent it, although I still wasn't completely certain what it meant. I never intended to leave Cleo, and Julia knew this, but things started getting more serious between us as Halloween approached, and I was faced with the unpleasant task of telling Cleo I wanted a divorce. I decided to put it off until after the Halloween party. I thought Cleo would decide against hosting the party, but she came out of her slump to organize it, and this was the happiest I'd seen her all year. It made me nostalgic for the old Cleo. She said she'd be able to show her face, because everyone would think she was in costume. I watched Miranda's video for what I decided would be the last time as I got ready for the party. There was a new comment from Lola saying I'd get what was coming to me. Whatever. I blocked both women. We'd hired a bouncer for the party after what happened the previous year. I also put hidden cameras in every room so I'd be able to show the police, if anyone did get past security, to leave threatening notes. 
assuming their costume didn't conceal their identity. The party went as planned, no uninvited guests showed up, and Cleo had the time of her life. She went to bed early because the pain got too much, but she was elated. I was almost tempted to make love to her, but even with the lights off, it would have been like having sex with a pensioner. Still, seeing the ghost of who Cleo used to be made me question my decision to leave her for Julia. I wasn't getting any younger, and I wondered if I could be happy with Cleo again when we were both ragged with age. I wasn't sure whether I was truly in love with Julia. She was more like a friend with benefits in many ways, but returning downstairs to find her in a skimpy nurse outfit made staying with Cleo seem unfeasible. The party ended at 5 a.m. I started to clean up but fell asleep on the sofa. It was still dark when I woke. A figure was kneeling over me. I wondered if I was dreaming when I realized it wasn't my wife or daughter. The intruder spoke. Everything could have gone back to how it was before. All you had to do was remain faithful for a year. Her voice was deeper now, but it was undoubtedly Lola. She blew me a kiss, sending powder from her hand to hit my face like a gust of icy snow. I woke up to Cleo shaking me. There were tears in her eyes. What's wrong? I asked. But as I came to, I saw that they were tears of joy. My mind gradually assembled another realization that was initially trapped in the fog of sleep. This was my Cleo, the 32-year-old she used to be, although she was now 33. If anything, she looked younger than she did before the rapid aging. The stooping posture was no more, and her hair, which had been limp and gray yesterday, was once again thick and naturally blonde. I'm me again, she said, wiping tears from her cheek. She kept returning to the mirror, barely able to believe it, like she needed to confirm it was still real. I don't mind getting old, I just don't want to do it before my time, and I can enjoy being a mom again, now the pain is gone. That's great, baby, but... How is this possible? I don't know, but it's happened. Her joy was infectious, and I found myself smiling, but I was also plagued by that feeling that something was wrong. I tried to put it down to my hangover, but the sense of ill ease grew stronger by the hour. I found myself checking the camera footage from the night before. The recording must have glitched because Lola appeared in the living room out of nowhere, wearing the same witch outfit from the previous year. She waved at the camera, and then vanished into thin air, like a ghost. None of the party guests seemed to notice or react. I panicked when I realized Payson had crept up behind me. I expected her to be as unsettled by the footage as I was. But instead, she had a look of awe on her face. She whispered, Cool, she really is a witch. When Payson had gone to another room, I checked the footage of me asleep on the sofa. I watched myself wake up abruptly and shuffle away from a figure that wasn't there. I flinched when the now invisible powder hit my face. A few days later, I started developing deep wrinkles around the eyes and mouth. My salt and pepper hair turned entirely gray over the course of one weekend. My muscles and joints ached relentlessly. No amount of ibuprofen made a difference. I'm sure you know where this is going. Julia broke things off. Eight months later, Cleo told me she was leaving. She now throws Halloween parties with some twat called Clay. Most of my friends ghosted me. Only Gavin stuck around, but I often get mistaken for his dad when we're out in public. I've been turned down for three jobs, 
because I was too old, despite being able to prove my age with my passport. The pain is getting too bad to work now anyway. I'll be on sickness benefits soon. I'm starting to think Payson was right about Lola being a witch. What I don't understand is, aside from what happened with Julia, what did I do wrong? I've never cheated on Lola or Miranda or anyone else. I don't deserve this. I was only unfaithful to Cleo because of Lola. She's a psychotic bitch who deserves to burn at the stake. I told her as much in an Instagram message, but she didn't reply. I still can't believe you agreed to this, I complain as the car drifts in the ice again. Heavy snow lasts well into March around here. I would rather be studying in the warmth of our dorms. Plus, we could take a drive in our university town and the roads would be ice-free. Car wouldn't be fishtailing every few minutes. Adam was invited to his friend's family home for somebody's birthday. I don't know why he didn't politely decline. He barely knows this friend. A friend who's a sexist piece of scum from what I could tell when I briefly met him last year. But that's Adam. He hates to disappoint people. It's one of the things I love about him, even if it's really annoying sometimes. I breathe a sigh of relief when we safely reach our destination, but my contentment doesn't last long. The house is a secluded, almost mansion. It looms over us, looking harsh and unwelcoming. We don't belong here. Adam rings the bell. I force a fake smile when the door opens. Buddy, you made it! Max Kensington greets us more loudly than necessary, pulling Adam into a hug. He ignores me and steps aside so we can drag our luggage indoors. The interior gives the impression of affluence trying too hard to be humble. Much of the furniture is rustic but reeks of old money. The taxidermy on the walls doesn't endear me to Max's family. I hate trophy hunting. Max makes the introductions. Adam, this is Trip. Adam, Trip. Trip, Adam. The men shake hands while Max continues to blank me. This is my girlfriend, Diane, Adam says, gesturing toward me. Hi, Trip mumbles, throwing me a brief smile before turning away. Max doesn't even glance in my direction. You're here, squeals a female voice. A petite brunette bounds into the hall like an excitable dog. You must be Adam and... Diane, I add. I'm Florence, Max and Tripp's cousin, but please, call me Flo. On the surface, Flo seems friendlier than her cousins, but there's something abrupt in her manner. The boys were talking about finding some wild foliage for decoration. Why don't you two go with them? Flo suggests. Somehow I can't imagine Max delicately picking out foliage. Sounds good, Adam agrees. I shoot him a look and suppress a sigh. It was a long drive. I thought we'd be offered a warm drink and given time to refresh in our room before being rushed off into the wilderness. Well, there is no time like the present. Off you trot, Flo commands. Shouldn't we take our cases upstairs first, I suggest, a pleading note in my voice. Oh no, there's no point in that. We could leave in an hour or two, Tripp says. I flash him a grateful smile, but Flo immediately crushes the idea, somehow shooing us out the door despite her small frame. She's intense, Tripp laughs when the door slams behind us. Intense, rude, I mutter. Adam flashes me a look of disapproval. She's just stressed because Grandpa's birthday is a big deal in our family, and there's still a lot to do. 
Trip explains. How old is he? 103 tomorrow, Max says proudly. Wow, that's impressive, Adam replies. We climb into Max's Land Rover, which is thankfully better equipped for the icy conditions than Adam's car. The wheels wear chains for stability. The family are obviously used to this level of snow. Max drives for about 20 minutes before pulling over near snowy woodland. What type of foliage are we looking for? I ask. Foliage? Max replies. For decorating. Oh, uh, any, I guess. Helpful, I mutter. Adam laughs quietly. We get out of the car. I'm glad I put on boots this morning because the snow reaches my shins. The cold bites and I long for gloves and a hat. There's a scarf in my suitcase, but of course bossy Flo didn't let us unpack. What's that for? Adam asks. I follow his gaze to find Trip strapping a shotgun around his chest. I don't agree with hunting. Please don't kill animals in my presence, I tell him firmly. Max repeats my words in a mock childish voice. Relax, Trip laughs. It's only a precaution. I prefer to use this. He holds up an axe. It's for the foliage, Max says irritably. A roar pierces the landscape. It's unlike anything I've ever heard. What was that? Trip asks in alarm. Some animal, obviously, Max says dismissively. Adam replies, but I don't hear him over the ear-splitting screech that comes next. Maybe we should go back, I suggest. Yeah, Trip agrees. Don't be little girls, Max snaps. Let's just get the foliage and leave. We don't have to go far. The cousins hike on ahead, their footprints breaking virgin snow. Something seems off, I whisper to Adam. I'm sure it's fine, he replies. Max did warn me his family are a bit eccentric. And you still agreed to come? What about those noises? Keep up, ladies, Trip calls. They wait for us to catch up. Should we head toward the trees for foliage? I suggest, pointing at the dense area of cedar pines nearby. The cousins exchange a glance. Nah, Trip mutters, and then he slams the axe into Adam's stomach. My legs collapse under me. The world slows down. It doesn't feel real until the freezing snow against my bare hands snaps me back into reality. Trip reaches for his gun, but Adam pushes the barrel toward the ground. Max takes the axe from Trip. Run, die! Adam screams at me. Get to the trees! I hesitate. I hate the thought of leaving Adam, but my dad's face comes to mind. We lost my mom when I was little. He can't lose me as well. He's always taught me that fitness is the best form of survival. I realize how right he is as I race for the cover of the trees. It's incredibly tough work in the deep snow. My muscles feel like they're tearing to shreds, but my high fitness level gives me an ever-increasing lead on Max. I think I'm going to make it when something strikes my back. I'm thrown to the snow with the air knocked out of me. I roll onto my back. Max is no longer holding the axe. I can't see it amongst the snow, but he must have thrown it at me. No blood blemishes the snow around me, and I can't feel anything embedded in my back. It seems the handle struck me rather than the blade, but it makes little difference. I don't have time to recover. Max stands over me with malice flickering in his eyes. I scream for help, knowing there's nobody around to hear. A rock flies from the direction of the trees, striking Max in the face. He falls to the ground. I look behind. There's an animal in the tree line. I think it's a monkey at first. It stood on two legs like a human, but it's covered in orange fur. 
It's about my height, but it doesn't look like an adult of its species. There's something baby-faced about its features. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was an abominable snowman. You know, a Sasquatch-type creature. Another one of similar height joins the first. A second rock is launched from its large hand. I turn round to see Trip approaching. Unfortunately, the rock misses. Max clamors to his feet. His face is a bloody mess. The right eye is gone, crushed into his skull. What the hell are those things? Trip yells. Shoot them, Max barks. I find myself on my feet before I know what I'm doing. I throw myself at the barrel of the gun, pushing it sideways as Trip attempts to fire at the creatures. The deafening blast is followed by a tremendous screech. The trees behind the snowmen sway in a way today's mild wind couldn't cause. Max runs back in the direction of the car, falling every few seconds. I see the butt of the gun a split second before it slams into my face. The snow is splattered with blood as I fall to the ground. I think the pain exploding from my mouth would have defeated me if not for one thing. I've landed beside the axe. Trip is too focused on trying to aim at the creatures as they dart behind the nearest tree to see me coming. I bury the axe in his neck. He collapses to his knees before face-planting the snow. I'm struggling to remove the axe from his neck when a winged creature, almost as tall as the trees, bursts out from the forest. It opens its long beak to let out a deafening screech. Its skin is black, stretched taunt and shiny, kind of resembling a beetle. The abominable snowmen are crouched behind a tree, trembling in fear. But the bird-like creature hasn't seen them. Its beady eyes are focused on Max. I protect my face with my arms as it stretches out its ginormous wings. It doesn't fly, perhaps it's flightless, but it runs at an incredible speed, catching Max within seconds. It snatches him off the ground with its beak before tossing him away, sending him catapulting into the trees. His screams are silenced by a dull thump, I doubt he could survive a fall from that height, especially at such velocity. The bird dives toward me. I throw myself flat into the snow. I hear my clothing rip and a searing pain tears down my back, but I'm not lifted from the ground. I shuffle back to Tripp's body and battle to free the gun that's still strapped around his torso. It's impossible until four large hands lift his corpse, the snowman. The bird launches itself toward us, but a third snowman leaps out from the trees and catches the bird's legs. This one really is Bigfoot. It's almost as large as the bird. Its fur is matted with blood, and it's clearly injured, but the ferocity in its eyes reminds me of the day my mom was killed. That's how she looked when those men approached us. It's the look of a mother who will stop at nothing to protect her young. Bigfoot swings the bird in circles and then throws it against the trees. Diane! I turn around at the sound of my name. I recognize the voice, but it feels too good to be true. It's him. It's Adam. He's gesturing for me to run back to him, but the snowmen saved me from unspeakable cruelty at Max's hands. I'm not leaving them. The mother stumbles toward us. The smaller two run into her arms. One of them makes panicked noises as the bird re-emerges from the trees. I raise the gun, but I don't know how to use it. Throw it to me, Adam yells. He's running toward us. We perform the perfect throw and catch. He points the weapon at the bird and fires. It takes several shots before it screams in pain and disappears into the trees. I hate seeing an animal killed, but it wouldn't have let us go. Maybe it will survive. I hope so. 
assuming it doesn't find the snowman again. Adam reaches us. He holds me as I cry in relief. The axe wound to his stomach looks nasty, but not life-threatening if we get to a hospital. I thought you were dead, I sob. I think Trip did, too. He must have thought I was a goner after I passed out. Why were they trying to kill us? They probably wanted me out the way to get to you. I I'm so sorry I brought you here. The large Sasquatch gently touches my shoulder. There's gratitude in her eyes. The younger ones hug me unsurely, seemingly copying the gesture from Adam. Then they wander back into the trees, hand in hand. Do you think they'll be okay? I ask. I've got a good feeling about them. These woods go deep. Maybe there's more of their kind out there, Adam replies. We have to walk back to the house because the car keys were in Max's pocket and goodness knows where he ended up. Luckily, Adam's keys are still in his pocket so we can leave without attracting Flo's attention. I think she knew of her cousin's intentions. There are more cars outside when we get back. Adam lets the tires down with the axe so they can't follow us. We'll have to drive slowly because of the ice. People appear at the window in response to the sound of our car starting. They look alarmed, but we're gone before they can stop us. Our injuries are treated at the nearest hospital. The nurse perks up when we tell her what happened, omitting mention of the snowman and the bird. It's weird, she says. A local drunk down on his luck claimed he was attacked by that family about five years ago. It was around this time of year. He raved about how they wanted to cook him for their grandfather's birthday meal. Apparently, they said human meat has healing properties, and eating it every year is how the grandfather survived to such an old age. Of course, nobody believed him. There was no evidence, and he had a huge amount of alcohol in his system. And old Mr. Kensington is such a nice man. It makes you wonder, doesn't it?